Joining us now is Oji Okwe with stories trending around the world. Hello, Jinika. You got it right. Good All morning. Right? Yes. <laughs> okay, I, now you're laughing. I, I saw that attempt. Yes, And I want to tell you to that calm it, down, not to it, show failed. Any excitement. it failed. It failed, Dr. Abati. <laughs> <laughs> what I, I get accused of uh, to showing too much emotions yeah. uh, when uh, Ojineka shows up. You are positively giddy. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, uh, Rufai. Oji, take charge. I will, as always. Good morning, Rufai. Good. Very good. All right. Yeah. Well, well, good morning to you viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In the United Kingdom, a picture of Queen Elizabeth II wearing a big smile as she returns to work 10 days after the memorial service of her late husband, Prince Philip, tops the trend. And for the first time since 1983, the largest naval flotilla and strike force assembled by Britain is set to sail in May on a month-long voyage through the Pacific. In the United States, the space race between the two richest men in the world went into hyperdrive on Tuesday after Elon Musk took a swipe at Jeff Bezos' attempt to challenge NASA's lander contract that was awarded to Elon Musk's SpaceX to build a spaceship that would deliver astronauts to the moon as early as 2024. And this year's first supermoon lights up the skies, dazzling people around the world. On Tuesday, the supermoon rose high above Buenos Aires, Santiago, Istanbul, Frankfurt, New Delhi, and Sydney. In Myanmar, a video released by a group that has proclaimed itself a new fighting force against the military junta shows about 120 youths running and chanting for the people around a muddy forest clearing. In Nigeria, fintech company Flutterwave has been listed as a pioneer on Time's newly released list of the 100 most influential companies making an extraordinary impact around the world. And a video of Senator representing Kogi West, Smart Adeyemi's emotional breakdown at the Red Chamber over the spate of insecurity in the nation has made the rounds. There's no food, people are hungry. Insecurity is threatening us. We cannot protect. It's better we're not here. That's the best thing that you have people die. Finally, under entertainment, Grammy Award winner Burner Boy's mother and manager, Bossa Ogulu, has been named as one of the 2021 International Power Players by Billboard. Well, let's begin what's trending in Nigeria. On Tuesday, the meeting between President Mohamed Buhari and the United States Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, generated mixed reactions. Security was one of the issues addressed during the meeting, as President Buhari urged the U.S. Secretary to consider moving the headquarters of Africa Command from Germany to the African continent to better tackle the growing insecurity in Nigeria and other African countries. The U.S. African Military Command Headquarters, AFRICOM, which was established in 2007, focuses on improving security in African countries. Tundu, I want to start with you on this story. I mean, a lot of people are saying that I, the idea of moving Africa to Nigeria is not what will solve insecurity. I tend to differ. I mean, I think that it is a great initiative. I think it's fine for them to move it here because obviously if it is closer to the African continent, they'll have access to you know, military equipment and intelligence and all whatnot. But the issue is the world is a global village. It is not the most important thing to do at this point. I think that the president should have, you know, urged for more intelligence and more fight against insecurity. I honestly tire of this <coughs> echo chamber of grievances. President Buhari is not doing anything. That's all we ever hear. He's now actually trying to do something, yeah. and even that is not enough. Earlier today, well, I was talking about when he said people walking around in the forest, you know, brandishing arms should be shot, and people complained about that. What exactly do we want? For me, this AFRICOM idea is a bright spot in a very bleak picture. My only hope is that America considers it favorably. It is better than nothing for crying out loud. Can we just make an effort to actually show some support? for good ideas, good initiatives. The whole world has been crying out. Nigeria is in a complete state of disarray at the moment. President Buhari is clearly unable to cope, and he should ask for help. He's asking for help, and somebody still has something to say. I don't get it. Dr. Abati. Well, first point to make is that you'll recall that about a week ago, Professor Wale Shoenka had made a point that, uh, look, 
Nigeria needs help, and Nigeria should ask for help. Other people uh, echoed that position by the Nobel laureate. And yesterday, uh, Nigeria actually asked for help. So this is one instance in which the uh, Buhari administration, you can say, uh, is listening uh, to public opinion. And it is encouraging to see that. Yesterday, two meetings, uh, President Buhari took, uh, met with, uh, virtually, uh, with the Secretary of State of the United States. And it was on that occasion that he asked that uh, Africans should come back uh, to Africa. And then, of course, the uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Minister, uh, Geoffrey Yama, also met with the uh, Minister for Africa uh, of the UK, Dodridge. Okay, fine. So we see that as an encouraging sign that Nigeria realizes that security problem is a serious problem. And National Assembly was talking about it. All of us were agonizing about it. Now, but there was a touch of irony to uh, the demand, the request that Africom should come to uh, uh, Africa. At the moment, the headquarters of Africom is at the Kelly Barracks in Stuttgart, Germany. And what happened in 2007 was that many African countries, including Somalia, Uganda, only Uganda and Liberia, accepted African command. They were saying that the United States would uh, intervene in African affairs and uh, to pose a security challenge uh, to African countries. Now, that African command, when it was established, was to cover the whole of Africa except Egypt. Egypt is under the uh, U.S. Uh, Central Command. But now we have uh, Nigeria. Maybe there will be other African countries now that will say uh, that the African command should come closer. And what was the original objective then? To protect the Gulf of Guinea, which remains a problem area uh, for Africa at the moment. Two, to also, you know, tackle Al-Shabaab. Uh, I think that's the group in uh, Kenya. And also tackle Boko Haram. And here in Nigeria, we still have this issue with uh, uh, Boko Haram. In uh, Central and Eastern Africa, they still have the issue with uh, Al-Shabaab. So I think that, you know, the diplomatic channels should be explored. However, the U.S. at the time said Stuttgart, Germany was just a temporary base. Mm -hmm. And we hope that the various bilateral uh, multinational uh, negotiations will go on if the U.S. is going to uh, accede to the request from Nigeria and maybe perhaps other African countries. All right, Rufai, do you think relocating Africa to the African continent will help tackle insecurity? It's a good idea, but I don't think it will entirely tackle insecurity in Africa. And these are my points. Number one, we all know the objective of Africa. America didn't have Africa up to 2007 when they set it up to be able to help Africa tackle its niggling challenges. And these challenges are there and they're staring at us in the face. What our favor is a more advanced form of Africa. So it's going to be a world joint tax force of troops from every part of the world to be able to come in to tackle this. Africa just got 2,000 personnel in Stuttgart in Germany. And what they really pretty much do is the logistics and back end reconnaissance and things like that. We need boots on the ground across the world. We need people to come in. You see, nations don't fight their wars all alone by themselves. They call in their friends to fight with them. When America was going to Iraq, it didn't fight alone, calling 40 countries to come fight with it. Yeah. So we need a world giant tax force. We have other methods in place, just like the G5 Sahel that is going on with France, Burkina Faso, Niger, and some other countries. But what we need to do is a world coalition. So, and how can we make this? I feel the president should call on the Security Council of the UN and call for help. Have this war joint tax force, people come together, and we put a lot of boots on the ground, provide technology, reconnaissance, and fight this warfare, and see that in the next two, three, four, four years, if we can fight it off, then we can mop it up with our own troops and the MNJTF we have. That's my approach. Great idea, but Africa alone will not do the job. All right. More on insecurity. We'll take another story in Kaduna State where bandits have released a second video of students that were abducted from the Federal College of Forestry Mechanization, AFACA. In the video, which has now gone viral, the students appealed to their parents and the government to facilitate their release. Some viewers may find this video distressing, so viewer discretion is advised. Let's take a look. My name is Shahara Paul. I'm from mm -hmm. Federal Forestry Mechanization. Please, you are calling on our parents to help us to come and take us out of here. They should try their possible best to see us out of here. We are suffering. Some of us are sick. We've not been eating well. Please, parents, help us so that we could come outside from this place. My name is Ben Slimanel. Please, we are begging on our parents, please, who might help us out of here. We've stayed here. We've stayed here for days. We have not been eating. Most of us have been sick. Most of us are hungry. Please, we are begging on our parents, please, come and help us, please. 
he's retired of it. Tendu, this is so heartbreaking. I mean, I, I cried when I watched this video last night. But now the conversation is what is going to happen to these children? You know, a video came out um, yesterday that resurfaced online on the governor of Kaduna State, where he was talking about the fact that, you know, he's uh, going to do anything in his power if he were in position when he was talking to the um, Jonathan administration. He talked about the fact that if it were Jonathan's daughter or anybody in power, they would negotiate with the bandit and release the students. I mean, or, 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 or the captured uh, children. That time, I think it was the Chibok girls that were abducted at that point. Five years ago, nobody is talking about terrorism in Nigeria. Under Jonathan, it has become an industry. As for rescuing the girls, we have seen examples of what countries do when this situation happens. You should have military action on the one hand and negotiation on the, on the other hand. If one of these girls was Jonathan's daughter, the story would be different. Hmm. The only reason why these girls are still in captivity is because they are not the daughter of any important man in Nigeria. I am in support of every option. When you have lives of your citizens at risk, you should not take any option off the table. You should be flexible. You should listen. You should negotiate and look at the price you have to pay. So, I mean, it is really heartbreaking to see. And I don't know what's going to happen to these children at this point. It is totally devastating, especially when you remember, how can we forget, that students of Greenfield University are being killed. And some of the mysteries surrounding the release of the students from Africa, you recall we were talking about the particular wording of how they were recovered. It's now sort of been explained that some of those students had ransom paid for them by parents who were able to raise that money. 17 million naira, that's quite a considerable amount of money. What happens to those whose parents cannot? And I cannot imagine how those parents will feel listening to their children plead with them when they're already trying to move heaven and earth to get their children out. They are already doing their best. Their best is just not good enough. And to see this will cause further devastation. They are suffering for no reason. As for Governor El Rufai, as it, what you've just said, in a short matter of time, when you were talking about Africa's previous position on AFRICOM, people do turn to 180 degrees. Well, I guess you have to go on a break, yeah, and so I'll we'll finish. Have to go on a short break, and yeah. when we return, what's trending on the morning show will continue. Stay with us. Welcome back to the morning show. We're still on what's trending. Tundu, before we went on a break, you were making your comment on the. Uh, abducted children. Yes, yeah, so I was talking about governor students. students. <laughs> I was talking about governors, Boku like a mommy. Yeah. No matter how old your children are, their children. Is. Yes. I was talking about Dr. Abati's point earlier about the change in position with regarding AFRICOM from then to now. Same as um, Governor El Rufai, 180 degree turn because now he sees what it's really like to wear those shoes. But the tragedy for me is that government policies are what they are. The reality is starkly different. He's saying that the government will never pay the bandits. You don't want to encourage banditry, what have you. But the parents are paying. The parents who can are paying. So either way, the bandits get paid. So withholding that money clearly is not the solution. So at this point, other options have to be considered. Exactly. Any option I, has I to be considered. Yes. yes. We'll take another story. The governor of Bainwish State, Samo Autumn, in a now viral video charged President Muhammadu Buhari to declare a state of emergency on insecurity in Nigeria. This follows an attack by suspected headsmen on internally displaced persons in the state that left seven people dead and many injured. The governor, while addressing the press on Tuesday, said the president must rise up to the security challenges in the nation. Let's take a listen. If the federal government have taken proactive steps, today we will not be where we are. These cops you have seen here, in the last two weeks, Burying over 70 people just in Makudi local government alone. And this is not accepted. Go to Guma, the same killings are taking place. Go to Gwen West, the same killings are taking place. This is not right. The federal government have refused to take proactive steps to arrest this ugly situation that we are witnessing here today. This is a bag in an IDD camp. There are journey villages here. With the recamp and the adjoining villages are occupied by IDPs. And what else do you want them to do? You send these people away from their villages, 
They came here to take refuge. And today, they are being killed in this manner. I'm aware that in Niger, in uh, Zamfara, all over the country, north east, north west, north central, uh, south east, south south, south uh, 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 west, all the places, this kind of public act is being taken. This is sad. My heart bleeds. And President Buhari must arise to his responsibility as the commander in chief of the armed forces. If he doesn't do it, our people say that the goat doesn't bite. But when you push it to the wall, you will buy. This is not right. This is not accepted. This is not accepted. President Buhari was elected by the people. He must arise and do something. I know the implication of telling people to go on self-help. And I want to repeat my call that if you are serious on this security matter, Mr. President, allow us to buy AK-47. Dr. Bati, finally we see a governor holding the president accountable for insecurity. Well, I mean, before now, we also saw Senator Smart Adeyemi on the floor of the National Assembly expressing uh, concern, and it was just as uh, passionate as the governor of uh, uh, Benue State. We've also seen members of the House of Representatives yesterday uh, calling for a state of emergency, uh, the challenge of security, insecurity in Nigeria to be declared a national emergency. I think in that regard, there will be a, you know, there is a meeting of minds uh, among Nigerians. But, okay, this is uh, Governor Autumn. Uh, you know, uh, coming across as uh, what uh, our brothers in Nasura call willing willers. You know, he was willing. He was, that's what they would call him. That's the label uh, that they use. But many Nigerians would also agree with him that uh, we face a very serious problem. 70 persons dying within two weeks, you know, in one local government. And he mentioned other local governments. But if you want to, uh, you know, flip it, then you could also ask the question, what are the efforts also being made by Governor Autumn and his team in Benue State? Uh, what efforts are they making? Uh, or is it that the governor is helpless? Because he was sounding helpless. Many governors say they are helpless. Is there something that governors can also do so that everything is not just about Buhari, 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 okay? Because President Buhari's uh, position is that we all have a collective responsibility. Now, in that full tape uh, that I saw, the governor of Benue made some other demands. He characterized Fulani people. He was complaining about the Fulanis who want to seize land in Benue. And he said, no, our land will not be taken. They will not allow their land to be taken. Now, I think it's a bit uncomfortable, I, I, I think, you know, for you to have the governor of a state, uh, you know, openly playing uh, ethnic politics. He also accused me, Yeti Allah, uh, uh, Kauta Hore of the role that they are playing. And he asked President Buhari to arrest the leadership of the uh, Mieti uh, Ala, right? So in addition to some of the other points he made, he also said that, look, the Fulanis from 14 countries had a meeting in Nigeria at some point, and they were opposing the prohibition of open grazing law. And he said in Benue State, his own state, that that prohibition of open grazing law will not be repealed contrary to demands uh, from other stakeholders in Nigeria. So it's really a very serious situation when you find a sitting governor uh, saying that uh, a goat will bite. You know, that uh, you know, uh, analogy that was uh, uh, you know, uh, articulating about when you push a goat, the goat will turn around and uh, bite. So it shows the extent of the frustration of the tragedy that we face. And if a whole governor is lamenting like this, how about the ordinary people who get killed on a daily basis? All right. We'll take our final story. Nigeria's Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, has come under fire for blaming the country's recent security challenges on the 1975 coup that ousted former head of state General Yakubu Gowan and brought Bortala Mohammed to power. The minister, in an interview on Tuesday, said insecurity would have been averted if General Gowan's plan to ensure free and compulsory education for primary school children was initiated before he was ousted from office. According to the minister, the rise in insecurity is as a result of the spike in the number of out-of-school children in the nation, adding that militants and insurgents have a ready army to recruit from the country's 13.2 million out-of-school children, 
holistic Twitter reaction in response to the minister from Ebong, who wrote, this government have no shame. They've blamed monkey, snake, the opposition, Nigerians, and now the 1975 coup. What a shame. Very soon, they'll be blaming Adam and Eve, and then God, but never themselves, for their failures. PDP never blamed even an aunt. Failure always blames others. Rufai, your take on the story. I mean, let us stop this blame game. It's, it's very irritating. You're going to blame everybody for the problem. What happened in 1975, close to 50 years ago? So since then, we can't use our own brain to set up a proper scheme for education. We declare state of emergency on education in 2018. I don't believe in state of emergencies. We keep declaring them. It goes nowhere. We declare state of emergency on education in 2018. We went on strike, ASU strike 2020. Is that the solution to the problem? Let's be sincere and fix the problem. And let's stop living in this denial. We say a country is burning. Somebody is blaming what happened in 1975. I mean, what is happening? A country is burning. There's insecurity. There's massive unemployment. Somebody is saying what happened in 1975 is causing the problem. If go on, go, go on could happened and, and, and nothing was done, can't you people set up an education you know, br blueprint or roadmap? Is that not why we voted a, a, a government in? Why, why do we keep looking to the past? And you will talk now, they will say you're a willing willer. Why do we keep looking to the past in this country? What concern? What happened in 1975? The coup has happened. We've moved on from there. Let's face now. I hate people going back. And let's stop declaring state of emergency. Let's find solutions to our problem with sincerity. See, John F. Kennedy said, human problems are man-made. A man can solve them. Nigeria's problem is man-made. A man can solve the problem of Nigeria. If we are ready and we are sincere, we'll solve the problem. If you were the minister, you would get tired of blaming everything on 16 years of PDP misrule. That phrase was used ad nauseum. So I think he thought, hang on a second, what's the next thing I can say? Then he had to reach all the way back it to 1975. I am so he, he had to, his it's board with saying 16 years of PDP wow. misrule. All right. Okay. That's all I have Thank for you guys you on much, What's uh, Trending today. Uh, we look forward to seeing tomorrow. you again tomorrow. Yeah.